Hello there folks, I'm Dan Brown from Sort of Interesting and today we're going to talk telescopes. I'm a big astronomer, or well, a short astronomer, but I'm very much into astronomy. If we turn uh, the camera just there, you'll see on board I've got my lovely Skywatcher Heritage 130p Dobsonian telescope. Deep breath needed before you say that, as usual. And um, I thought I would just introduce a few different ideas about the sort of equipment that you need for any beginner astronomers out there. Now that the winter is here and we've got plenty of nice, clear, cold, dark, nights that stretch on from about half four in the afternoon it seems. <laughs> so first of all we'll have a very quick look at the telescope close-up and then really this video is more about uh, accessories and eyepieces and things like that but let's dive in and have a look. So if you'll excuse not seeing my face while I speak to you here this is my lovely little telescope. Uh, the good thing about the Heritage 130p as you can see is it's collapsible. So first things first we undo those and then as you can see it extends outwards and then you definitely want to tighten that up so that it doesn't start sliding back if you've got it pointing upwards. Obviously a lot of the time with astronomy you will be looking upwards at the sky. Um, if I move across the camera there, sorry, pop out the end cover there and pretty much that's the setup. Um, and you go from obviously having a nice uh, relatively durable storable telescope to a fully functioning extended telescope. Uh, we've got a red dot finder scope that works pretty well here. Uh, this is the focuser, so you literally drop an eyepiece into there, tighten it up and then uh, focus by turning that around. And well, as you can see, obviously you've got the mirror there, that's the secondary mirror. I think, yeah, that's the secondary, primary at the back, secondary at the front. and. Well, that's the basic look at the telescope. Obviously for me, being able to collapse it up and not have the big tripod and counterweights and things like that is a huge bonus for having limited space living on a boat as I do. And personally, I've never been a huge fan of proper finder scopes or anything and I find the red dot finder scope there absolutely spot on for what I wish to use it for and works perfectly for me personally, so I'm happy with that. And Really, there's not much to say. You can see a proper review of this um, while I'm sat out on the roof of the boat talking about it. So check that out if you want to see more on the scope specifically. Uh, the focal length, which is basically the distance that the light travels inside the telescope, is 650, which now, when we move on to the next step of this video, which is eyepieces, I will explain the relevance of... And now. here you can see my very small collection of eyepieces. And there is a reason that I've only got three eyepieces plus a moon filter. And that boils down, really, to the basic point of I never really used any of the others. I've been through quite a few different eyepieces and a few different filters too. And in the end, ultimately, ended up just putting them back on eBay. Because this, personally for me, and the way that I like to enjoy astronomy, is the perfect setup. And if I wasn't using the other eyepieces or filters, I thought there was absolutely no point for me personally to start building up a very expensive collection of glass, basically. Um, the first two here we have got are the eyepieces that came with the telescope. That one is a 4mm Celestron Omni eyepiece, and that really is just a basic moon filter. Really, what you would expect, something to take the glare of the moon away. And when we have a closer look here, what I was saying before about what the focal length is, that is relevant because, and if you're watching this and you're a keen astronomer or anything like that, then obviously remember that this is aimed at beginners and an introduction to astronomy in general. Uh, working out the magnification of an eyepiece isn't just a simple thing of one eyepiece has one magnification in any telescope. Basically, you take the focal length of the particular telescope you're going to use and then... For example, this is a 25mm eyepiece, and you basically divide the focal length by the size of the eyepiece. So in this case, it's 650 divided by 25, which it works out at... What is that, everybody? Yes, that's right, 26. So that makes this a 26 times magnification uh, eyepiece. Then similarly, this is 10 millimetres, so that's basically dividing by 10, so that makes 650 into 65 magnification. And then when we get to the 4 millimetre one, this gives a whopping 162.5 times magnification. And between that, 
uh, between those three, that's all that I really ask. So then, eyepieces, let's talk about what exactly are they and why do you want multiple versions of them? Now, fundamentally, the job of an eyepiece is to focus the light that the telescope gathers that obviously then you look through, hence the name eyepiece. Um, I'll just point out here that the sleeves on this shirt seem to be getting shorter and shorter and I have no intention to be wearing a near vest in front of you all. So just pointing that out as I'm as vexed as anyone as to why these sleeves are now about a centimetre long. Um, anyway, back to astronomy. Back to a sensible video again now. Now, as we just discussed about the various magnifications of eyepieces and how they're not uniformed, so you won't get the same magnification through the same eyepiece in a different telescope necessarily. And the reason that you want different magnifications are obviously to zoom in and out effectively on whatever you're looking at in the sky. Now, something that a lot of people, and I certainly didn't understand at first, was that the bigger the magnification doesn't mean the better the astronomy session and it's actually the exact opposite I find and the most used eyepiece that I have is my 25mm one which gives me in my telescope 26 times magnification. Uh, I would say then sometimes I use the 65 magnification and then the only time I ever use the 162.5 magnification is if I'm either viewing a planet or the moon so basically something that you want to see only that item in the eyepiece so obviously something like Jupiter you can look through this and just about if you get it all perfectly lined up and perfectly focused you can see the very faint lines of cloud on it and you can see the four moons and it's just fantastic the same with Saturn something like this that gives me 160 plus magnification I can really see Oh, well, I can start to see the details that you really associate with good astronomy. I mean, it's still only tiny, tiny uh, images and only a very tiny sort of the size of a hole punch, maybe, um, when you look through it and see something like Jupiter. But it's once you start to fall in love with astronomy that things like that will become amazing to you. And really, you'll either love it or you'll be like... Oh yeah, it's just Jupiter and it looks really small and blurry still. Um, but that's where you want the high magnifications. Something that you want, obviously, a very close-up, very detailed look at. And personally, I'd say even um, something like the moon. Uh, it's the only real details that you can see on the moon. And the best things to see on the moon are when the shadow is uh, passing across as it's going through its cycle. If you look at a full moon, you can't see that much detail. But where the shadow of like a half moon, for example, say... The shadowy side halfway across the face of the moon is where all of the shadows of like the craters and it looks like huge mountain ranges that you're viewing and they really do look fantastic. But I'd say even at 160 magnification might be a little bit high to be honest and I'd say certainly looking with 65 magnification at the moon you have a great uh, view because you can focus it really well. It doesn't move too uh, fast across your view and also... One of the great things with a slightly lower magnification is you get a lot more in view, but you've still got a much closer uh, view of it, if that makes sense. Um, you're not focusing on a very small part, so you can see like, a larger area at a relatively high magnification and sort of have a context of, wow, look at all that uh, detail we're seeing, all those craters that are cramming into one view. And, well, when we come back down to this... Like I say, in my case, this gives me 26 times magnification, and that is really what I use all the time. And ultimately, this is the sort of thing that just general astronomy is about looking in the sky and seeing vast quantities of stars. I mean, you'll, I'll look through a telescope like this. Uh, I don't know, say something I... Oh, I, uh, the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades, however you want to pronounce it. And by the naked eye, you can see, if you've got a very clear sky, you can see the seven stars and a sort of glow around it. But when you look at a telescope like this, and, well, even a telescope that's pretty much half the size of that with half of the light gathering power, you'll still see well over 100 stars in that area. And it's just absolutely fantastic. And obviously, in cases like that, you don't want to have a very close-up, um, very zoomed-in view because a magnification that's that high means that you don't see all of these hundreds of stars that, well, if you view over the, all over the sky and all over the sort of the clouds of the, the side of the Milky Way, 
then you will see thousands and thousands of stars through that that you can't see with the naked eye and it's just amazing to see. Whereas if you're using a nice simple 26, 25, whatever, sort of mid-twenties magnification, you've got all of that, like loads of stars, hundreds and hundreds of stars at a time that you can't necessarily see with the naked eye. And obviously you've got to be looking in the right place to see that many stars in one go. But as you view, as you scan across the sky and see that many stars, it's that's the core of what is amazing about astronomy. And then you can start picking out little clusters and figuring out these little uh, messier objects and things like that, that you can really start to get in and search for different items and different star clusters. And it's the low magnifications that give you that huge view of the sky, but add in so much more that the naked eye can't see. That's the really useful one and the one that gives you the truly awe-inspiring things as an amateur astronomer. Now, if you were getting really detailed and had a super telescope that cost about five times the amount of my good old heritage here, then that's when you can start really getting into really super fancy um, filters and eyepieces. And those ultimately become the sort of the hardcore astronomers that maybe you watching this will one day become and start teaching me all about astronomy because I'm certainly no expert, I'll say that much. Um, but really, the lower magnifications are the better ones for viewing the sky in general. And then maybe something like a 65, if you've, got, if you've picked out a specific star cluster or something you want to see closer, then go for something like that. And then you'll obviously be able to see, hopefully, more detail on it or uh, pick out more individual stars, something like that. But really, low magnifications are for general viewing, which are ultimately the sort of astronomy sessions that I love and what are the heart of it to me personally. Higher magnifications for planets and things like the moon. And if you've got a very nice telescope, I'm sure that you won't be watching this video going, oh yeah, this is all news to me, but... As you get more and more into astronomy, you'll really start to get to grips with all these different ideas. Um, the other thing that I should talk about is filters. Ah, filters, however that sentence should have been said. And a filter is basically a sheet of glass. This one is a moon filter, so it's basically a grey sheet of glass. Um, and these screw into... Oh, in fact, I can show you right here. Um, these screw into the end of an eyepiece and as you can see that locks tightly in there and in fact in some cases if you're very fancy you can stack different coloured ones together to give you various um, viewing, uh, I don't know, letting different types of light through to hopefully give you a better view of certain details on certain items in the sky. Once again that's the sort of thing that you would be doing with a much bigger telescope than this really though. Um, and basically this means now, if I look at the moon, obviously passing through a tinted uh, sheet of glass means that it's not going to be quite so blinding with how much light you can gather through there. Obviously it's that to give you a sore eye if you're looking at something very bright like the moon. And obviously never look at the sun through a telescope. Um, so that's just my warning and my personal obsession with safety and not having any serious incidents. But something like the moon obviously is still very bright when you look at it in comparison with other things in the sky. So a moon filter is great for taking out some of the edge that the moon has in that glaring at you through the telescope. Um, there's all sorts of coloured filters, there's all sorts of different types of chemical sounding filter and a lot of these can become very expensive. Just like the eyepieces, they can start to cost as much as you want to pay basically. And if we have a look out again at this... Like I say, this is a simple moon filter there, hopefully you can see, and it just takes glare off the moon. I had a neodymium filter, which is meant to be super fancy and give all this sort of, gets rid of various things like a bit of sky glow and light pollution, things like that, as well as a few other various, uh, I don't know, benefits to astronomy. And I think really, once again, it's the sort of thing you need for a bigger telescope if you're doing much more detailed and in-depth items than I was. And you will, well, if you're a beginner, you may or may not believe that something as small as this, my neodymium one, cost about 67 quid. And this is literally a sheet of glass that's basically about, well, as you can see me there, hello. Um, I'd say it's about the size of a two pence piece for anybody in England. I'm sorry for anyone in the rest of the world. I'm not sure of your currency and sizes of coins. But 
That's, this is why, really, my simple moon filter plus three eyepieces is my perfect setup. I've gone for various filters, like I say, that I just don't feel are worth the money personally for the results I was getting through this telescope. But of course, that's not saying that it's a bad filter or if you had a different telescope or a bigger scope, it wouldn't have amazing effects on your astronomy. But really, like I've tried to say with the eyepieces, you're not necessarily going to have uniform results from one telescope plus one filter or one telescope plus this filter plus that eyepiece and then try it in a different telescope or try a different eyepiece from a different set or different range in a different telescope and that sort of thing. It's not uniform, so really you've just got to test things out. But I'd say really expensive items are for later on and once you've got a telescope that's a little bit bigger, better and pricier than that one in the background there. Um, ultimately though, it's just see what you like. If you're somebody who finds that you only ever want to look at the moon and the sky doesn't interest you, then other eyepieces and other magnifications might be more suitable. Personally, the lowest magnification that I've used is 20 times magnification with this telescope, and I was expecting to see loads of the sky in the view and all these stars in it, but in reality what actually happened was it just showed me a lot of the sky, but the magnification was so low that you didn't really have the definition and clarity to be able to say, oh, these are all different stars, rather than them starting to get grouped back in together. And it didn't look as impressive as seeing slightly less of the sky, but in more detail. And that's really the sort of thing that you've got to test out yourself and see what you think is your perfect setup and how you want to use your, t your telescope. And, well... I've spoken quite a long time to the camera, a lot longer than I was expecting to have spoken on this subject. So I think I'm going to wrap things up now and say thank you very much for watching. Check out my other astronomy videos. I'll post the link in the description below. And, well, really, make sure you like the Facebook page. Uh, you can add me on my personal Facebook account if you want and Twitter and all that sort of stuff. And if you're so interested in narrowboat life, please check out my book about my first year living on board Tilly. It's called The Narrowboat Lad. Only £1.53 for Kindle, so check that out. And, well, until the next time, hopefully you'll get some clear weather to get out at night with your telescope. And, well, if you do, have a fantastic night, and I'll see you around soon. Farewell.